Hi, I'm Paul Grand, CEO of MedTech Innovator. Nice to see everybody here. For those of you who don't know MedTech Innovator, let me tell you very quickly what we're all about. MedTech Innovator is an accelerator. I am the CEO and founder. We started this back in 2013, and we are now the world's largest accelerator for medical technology. Uh, we have 420 companies in our portfolio. I'll tell you more about that in a second, but the key is MedTech Innovator is trying to find the best companies in the entire world. No geography in, is in particular for us. We're completely agnostic to geography, trying to find the best companies in the world and make sure they're successful at actually reaching patients and make sure they do that with the maximum value possible so they can be successful. The picture you see here is from the, the companies graduating from a couple of years ago on the stage in our finals and uh, some of the products from the alumni before them. At this point, our alumni have raised over $4 billion in funding, which is a big deal. And I mean after MedTech Innovator, not the money they had before MedTech Innovator. Last year alone, our alumni raised close to $2 billion. The entire industry raised about $8.8 .8 billion. So about one in five dollars were going to our portfolio, which is pretty incredible. Um, we've seen over 7,000 companies apply to MedTech Innovator. We're seeing a, a ton of the innovation that's out there. Um, and our companies after, you know, as I said, almost 10 years, 95% are still in business um, or have been acquired, which is just unheard of. We had over 1,000 companies apply this year. And what we're doing right now, we did this yesterday, is we're running these events where we're inviting about 20% of our applicants to present. Um, and that's entirely based on our corporate partners. So the corporate partners who um, we work with, which you'll see in a second, they're the ones choosing the companies that get advanced to our pitch events. We'll choose our 50 showcase companies. Um, a subset of those will be part of our, what we call accelerator cohort. Um, and eventually we'll have a winner at the end, but really the program itself is the prize. There's resources, visibility, mentorship, all sorts of amazing things these companies get. They're part of the most high performing group of people in the med tech industry when they get to be part of med tech innovator. Our corporate partners, many of whom are here in the audience right now, are highly engaged in this program. They're the ones who choose the companies to participate. They mentor the companies. They are the ones who really drive everything. We're facilitating an incredibly intense process where they all participate. We had an event yesterday where we had 30 of our companies present. Those companies were presenting across all clinical areas. There was no specialty yesterday. You know, you can see a little bit of what that looks like on this video over here. So this is yesterday um, in the same space that we're in now. Um, we had, not this room, but I think a couple of rooms, but we had, um, uh, we had about 70 judges who were there. Um, and the judges are there from all across the industry. Some are here in the room today. Uh, I see Richard over here in the second row. Um, we had all sorts of judges who are here participating, um, sharing their expertise with these companies. It's not just the companies presenting to the whole room. We break out in judging groups, um, and each company gets to meet specifically with the judges who are interested in them, um, which is really unique. I see Chelsea over there a couple rows back. Um, hey, guys, Proxima team, uh, Isabel and so on. Okay, so anyways, the point is, our judges are there to give feedback and guidance to these different companies. It's not just to hear their pitch and say, oh, I like them, here's a check and, and some applause. They're gonna mentor these companies. Um, and we ask all the judges, hey, do you wanna mentor this company? Like, is this somebody you wanna work with? Uh, and they tell us if they do, and then eventually they wind up mentoring these companies. So it's a very, very engaging program. And as part of that, we ask all of our judges for some feedback on which companies you liked. Um, you know, and you know, Kenny Tran over there from Asahi would say, hey, I, I like this company. I think these guys were great. Um, somebody else will say something else. We go through this process. We look through the, you know, we're always going through and trying to find the companies that everybody really wants to work with and they like. Um, and so out of that, we chose two companies to give you a presentation today. Um, so you might call them our judges' choices. Um, for today, and I'm, gonna, I'm happy to uh, present those companies. These are all the companies that presented yesterday. Um, the two companies we selected were SafeBeat and Symphony, uh, and you're gonna get to hear their presentations now, and you'll see a little bit of why we picked them. Uh, and uh, I, if there's a little bit of time, maybe you'll get to ask them some questions, but if not, you can ask them questions afterwards. First off, let me bring up Kunj Patel. So uh, why don't you come on up? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So we're SafeBeat RX. 
making life-saving EKG software that replaces a hospitalization. A little bit about the founders, we're both physicians. I was a pain physician, started a private practice from scratch. Um, after training from Harvard, we, we um, negotiated all the insurance contracts, hired all the staff. So although I'm a first-time founder, I've experienced building a healthcare delivery system from scratch. But more importantly, my founder is an EP cardiologist who trained at Stanford and is on a lot of the national guidelines committees and, and is very well connected in the cardiology space. We're joined by machine learning programmers and engineers and regulatory experts as part of our in-house team. So the problem we're solving is heart rhythm disorders. Specifically, there's over 2 million new patients each year who are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And the problem is that it causes over one in four strokes for patients over the age of 40. The most effective treatments for these are oral antiarrhythmic pills that are class three antiarrhythmics. This is based on new data and the guidelines are gonna be changed. You always wanna go where the hockey puck is going, not where it already is. These medicines already comprise 42% of antiarrhythmics that are prescribed, but to start them, you have to spend three days in the hospital to initiate these drugs. These are well-feeling well patients many times who are just doing this to start oral pills. And the reason why they have to be in the hospital is because 0.6% of patients from the early drug trials can have a fatal arrhythmia. So basically what's happening is 200 patients are getting sent to the hospital for the one that may have an issue. And what happens in the hospital is a cardiologist will come by and measure with manual calipers on a paper EKG, these small intervals, the QTC interval, to make sure that it's not prolonging so that their risk of having a fatal arrhythmia doesn't occur. And with good monitoring, we looked at hospital data and there have been no like shocks or defibrillations uh, for the past five years at, at some of the major hospital systems. So we wanna turn this from analog to digital. And so that's where we came in with our kit. We're combining FDA approved wearables with our proprietary machine learning based software. So what we do is we use a mobile EKG device, uh, also mobile cardiac telemetry for uh, 24 seven real time monitoring and a wearable cardiac defibrillator vest that can shock uh, the patient if they are in that rare percentage that has a side effect. Our software will be automating the measurements, looking at trends, and even recommending a dosage for the doctor so they have two-click approval for 90% of the patients. Why now? It's the golden era of telehealth and these advanced prescription-only EKG wearables uh, exist. Hospitalization, it's expensive. $26 billion are spent for atrial fibrillation 75% of which is just for the hospitalization, so 26 billion for AFib. And this is something that each hospitalization, we looked at Barnes Jewish Corporation data, $17,000 per admission, and the majority of hospitals actually lose money on these admissions because the margins really are not great. Payers wanna not pay $17,000 per admission for this, and doctors and patients, that's what drove us here. We, we heard complaints all day long. So all the key stakeholders are aligned on this. We have support from insurers, from uh, some of the top universities, and also from some of the key societies. We have KOLs from the key societies as well on our advisory board. It's a big market. Uh, like I said, over 2 million new atrial fibrillation patients per year. And we have our long-term vision on pharma trials because every new drug needs heart rhythm monitoring for FDA approval. QTC is the most common reason drugs are declined. And we can, we can revolutionize that too, we hope. We filed two provisional patents that will be converted to PCTs next month and our machine learning uh, algorithm already is better than the standard accepted error. We completed a phase one trial that showed that we're better than 90% accurate already, and that's continuously improving as our algorithms improve, and we're starting phase two clinical uh, enrollment starting next quarter at UCSF. We started a wait list for just a week and a half, and cardiologists already committed 160 patients per month, and we got a lot of market, great market insight. We're submitting our 510K by the end of this month is our target and to be launched by the end of next year. And to accomplish all these milestones, we'd raised almost $3 million after going through Y Combinator. TechCrunch had picked us as one of the top companies on demo day out of 400 companies. Um, it gave us a lot of traction. We have some institutional investors, 50 years is our lead, Harvard Management Company and some others that are well known in the Valley. Um, we're, we're super happy with our world-class uh, board of advisors and yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. We're building life-saving EKG software that focuses on treatment rather than diagnostics, which is uh, what you see most other companies. So yeah, happy to par uh, talk with anybody further. And yeah, thank you. All right. Great, so next up, 
we're going to have uh, Dr. Manish Butte come tell us the Symphony Biosciences story. Um, and he's got some of his other team members here too, but come on up. Uh, and uh, it's a UCLA story, so pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Go Bruins. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And uh, so my name is Manish Butte. I'm an immunology professor here at UCLA. And I'm going to be sharing the story of our startup, Symphony Biosciences. Uh, and the technology I'm going to share with you was born in my lab here. And if, if, if it was born in my lab, the mother of this technology is, my, is Nagin, who's over on the side here. She's our CEO. And Madi is our chief scientific officer. I'm going to show you our team slide at the end, but I want to introduce. Uh, we are all of Symphony Biosciences. We're an early stage startup. And our goal is to fight cancer uh, by empowering the immune system by using innovative biomaterials. So what do I mean? What are the cancers we're going after? Specifically, we're going after solid tumors. So not leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, it turns out that solid tumors are the cause of most cancer deaths. You know which cancers I'm talking about, lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer. These are solid tumors. And the reason that they are so hard to beat and that they kill so many people is because these tumors create a microenvironment around them that resists the immune system from moving in and clearing tumors by themselves. Our body is naturally designed to fight tumors, and yet these solid tumors actually prevent that. How do they do that? They create a microenvironment that creates regulatory T cells. So as the T cells show up and try to fight, here, let me. As the T cells show up and try to fight the tumor, they are uh, converted in the tumor microenvironment to becoming regulatory T cells. Those are policemen T cells. They stop the immune response so that when cytotoxic T cells move in and try to kill, they are inhibited. If you take any solid tumor, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, et cetera, cut it in half and look, you'll see plenty of T cells in there trying to fight the cancer. They just can't because of these kinds of inhibitory barriers. Our technology overcomes these barriers and allows the body's natural immune system to fight and clear cancers. Okay, so our first area that we're gonna to go to market with is triple negative breast cancer. Many of you have heard of this cancer. This is the um, kind of breast cancer that is much more insidious, much more uh, uh, harmful because there are no targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer. Unlike the breast cancers that have sex hormone receptors or growth factor receptors that can be targeted, this one doesn't. And because of its genetic mutations, it's much more aggressive. And so the, uh, the mortality rate is much higher, the survival rate's much lower compared to other breast cancers. There are about 40 40,000 women who are diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer every year in the United States. And again, there are no therapies. If we go after this particular therapy just for its unmet need, uh, that would be a, a critical first step for us. But also, this is an important area for us to go after because the FDA allows trials in triple negative breast cancer that don't have survival as an endpoint. So we can do our trials looking at immunological, radiological, or histological endpoints that are easier to get to, easier for our company to get through our phase one and phase two trials. Now, if we think about this particular uh, breast cancer, we think our total accessible market is around half a billion dollars. But if we think about other solid tumors like this that have a surgery involved, that are rarely curative, and that really do in, in need the immune system to, to um, fight, then we can go after other solid tumors like you could see here, and our total accessible market is in excess of $4 billion. So what is our, what is our technology? Uh, it looks like this. It's Symph node, and it's a, um, I have a example of it right here. Uh, this is a um, biodegradable, biocompatible biomaterial that's a, that's a porous material. And it's a sponge, and it's loaded with um, factors that we use to activate the immune system. It's implanted surgically or by an interventional radiologist right next to the tumor, and then it turns on the immune system to fight the cancer. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at breast cancer. So when a surgeon or an interventional radiologist, uh, after a woman palpates a, a mass, goes in to take biopsies or to implant in uh, uh, marker devices to tell where the tumor is, at that time, they can, she can plant into the tumor space uh, one of these. These can be made in a variety of form factors. It looks like a little disc here, but we can make it any shape uh, based on whatever tumor is being targeted or whatever delivery mechanism is being used. So the symph node sits next to the tumor, and then it attracts T cells into the tumor. It also gets rid of those regulatory T cells that are holding back the T cells. And the consequence of this then is that the T cells can move in and clear the tumor away. Now, it's important to note that the technology made by Symphonode can't be done by systemic therapy. If you were to inject these kinds of chemicals systemically, you would get all kinds of immunological side effects. We know this. If you overactivate the immune system, you get a lot of side effects. Uh, it also can't be done by local injections because you end up with the, the diffusion of these materials away from the tumor prevents uh, activity. So we've tested this now in two models, a melanoma model and a triple negative uh, breast cancer model in mice. 
And I'm going to run through this to show you that we have been able to uh, dramatically expand survival of mice with triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and in fact, many of the mice uh, do not die. So we think we have really generated a potential cure for this very aggressive tumor. And when we look at tracking these tumors, we see that the tumors are largely gone when we use lymph node, and more importantly, that we've eliminated metastases. So this is really important because we're not just giving chemo to the tumor. We're activating the immune system that goes down and chases the tumor in other parts of the body and fights and, and can clear away metastases. So this technology is patented, of course, thanks to UCLA, and we, are, uh, we have an exclusive option signed with UCLA. And we, we plan on also um, furthering the capabilities of other companies who are making CAR T cells to fight other solid tumors. So of course, our main technology is using the body's own immune system to fight. But these other companies out there are making CAR T cells to fight tumors too. And one big problem that they face is that when you intravenously deliver T cells, they don't get to solid tumors. They go find the lymph nodes. They fight lymphoma just fine, but not solid tumors. By delivering the CAR T cells in, in, in a lymph node, what happened there? Uh, they, can, uh, they can be delivered uh, directly into the tumor, and we have preclinical data to support that. So right now, we've raised a pre-seed round. Right now, we're interested in raising about $2 million in a seed round. We've rented space in Magnify, and we've begun working with CROs to, and, uh, and a GMP manufacturing uh, capability to try to get through our pre-IND meeting and have our IND in about a year and a half. And if everything goes well, a phase one trial in about two years. Uh, this is our team. I've already introduced everyone. Nagin and Madi are both uh, PhD bioengineers who work here at UCLA. And now uh, Nagin is a full-time and CEO of the company. And we've put together a great advisory board, including one of the foremost breast cancer surgeons here at UCLA. Thank you.